uh, a guide to reading the Psalms. And <clears throat> we're not going to be able to cover everything tonight on this, but I want to at least highlight some things that will help you uh, appreciate not only the whole collection of Psalms, but at the same time give you some ideas that might help you as you, as you read the Psalms. Um, it's hard uh, to refrain from treating the Psalms uh, like an anthology of 150 separate songs that we dip into now and then. And if we're not careful, that's about the only way we use the psalm. We'll dip into them now and then when we need a verse. And if that's how we limit our use of the psalms, uh, we're the ones that's going to miss out on the blessings. Uh, one of my greatest joys was being able to sit down over the course of two days. Uh, we were living uh, up in Michigan and we took a youth group and the youth minister, and we went up uh, to the Upper Peninsula, the UP, and was working with a church uh, one week in the summer. And the, all of the young people had a particular direction that they went with their devotional, and it was geared to them. And I thought, I, I need to do something uh, I haven't done uh, that will be uh, beneficial for my time while the, while the young people are doing their thing. And so I went way out into the, I'll never forget this, went way out into the, a pasture with, it had, it had grass growing and there were birds flying in the pasture. And of course, this is, this is in July in the upper, in the UP. So um, the weather's not warm up there. In fact, sometimes the cold, the, the coldest part of the summer can be around July the 4th up there. But anyway, I remember spending a chunk of time, two afternoons, beautiful setting, just sitting out in the pasture. My Bible was open, and I started with Psalm 1, and over two days read all 150 Psalms. And I had never done that before, and somehow seemed to gain such an appreciation for that whole collection I'd never had before. And things jumped out at me that I noticed apparently I had just read over. It's easy to do that. And that experience helped me realize the depth and the breadth of the expressions of faith that I had taken for granted all through the years, but to find them in the context of the Psalms was just so wonderful. It seems that in the recent past, and, and this is, there's a place for this, but when you read in the literature, there's so much being done on the cultural and historical background to the formation of the collection of the Psalms. And most of those questions don't really help us, uh, or at least on, on, on a day-to-day -day basis, to really make the best use of these Psalms. If you're not careful, some of the stuff that you read kind of ends up being academic and up in the clouds. You're like, okay, but how's that, how's that helpful right now? But what's been interesting is for me to notice that within the recent years um, of study about the Psalms, uh, there have been three specific questions that have come up that demonstrate an interest in the biblical text itself and what the Bible is saying. The first question is, how may the shape and character of the book of Psalms be described? Um, is it important that we have 150 of them? Uh, is it important that from some of the oldest arrangements that we have, uh, it's understood to be a collection of five big books, and your study Bible may have you know, those chapters that include each of the five books. Um, so what, what is the book about? The second question is, uh, what can be said about the purpose of the Psalms uh, given the final form that we have it in? What is the purpose of the Psalms? Uh, because, and see, that question doesn't get asked too often if we're just used to diving into it, getting a few verses we like, and then coming back out. Uh, and, it, and unfortunately, it doesn't treat all 150 psalms as a collection. And then number three, um, how does our understanding of what comprised an ancient psalm 
Help us to understand and interpret the collection that we have. So what about ancient Psalms? What were their purpose? Uh, we're going to be looking a little bit tonight into some of the things that are critical to that. And I think there are three reasons for this shift and being interested uh, in Psalms itself. The first is uh, a broad, renewed interest in biblical studies to get back to what the text itself says. And for many of us, uh, we're used to asking that kind of question. And we like to see when people ask those kind of questions. Number two, Israel's background and interaction with the Psalms helps us figure out how they're to function in our world today. See, if you ask the question, how were the Psalms used by Israel, does that help us to see how we need to use them today? And then a recognition of how important they were in the teaching of the early church. Uh, and Jesus and the apostles used them for their teaching. For example, uh, you take the book of Hebrews. It is fascinating how the writer of the book of Hebrews will take a number of Psalms and build a framework of the ministry of Jesus based on the Psalms. And then not only does he do that, but he ties to those um, texts of Psalms in the book of Hebrews. He takes the ministry of Jesus and lays that down as a foundation for Christian living. It's really amazing how the writer of Hebrews does that. But it's all because he has the strong belief that the Psalms weren't just for Israel, they're for us today. And that's how he uses the Psalms. So with the above three set of questions, uh, and, and then the three reasons for renewed interest, kind of gives us a starting point uh, to dive into the Psalms. And the first thing that needs to guide us as we start reading the Psalms is that the Psalms focus on the sovereign reign of God as king over all the earth. And you come across such expressions as, um, in God we trust, in God I trust. There are these Psalms of trust because God is king over all the earth. Uh, the second is, and I've come to the point where I really believe this strongly, and as time permits, we're going to focus a little bit on this tonight in our lesson. But the Psalms lays out for us what the blessed life is all about. And we will, we will demonstrate that a little bit later. Fifty-one times in the book of Psalms, the word blessed is used. More than any other book in the whole Bible. And as you go through the book of Psalms, you can make a strong case that what the psalmist is trying to do is help his readers really understand what is the blessed life all about. Uh, the last reference of being blessed is found in Psalm 146, 5. And it's kind of interesting how it ends. Listen to this. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob and whose hope is in the Lord his God. Help and hope. It doesn't get more basic than that related to your belief system. And the blessed life, I would say, is based on the idea that any help you need basically comes from God, and the hope you need to keep on living this blessed life and even motivates you to want to live that, comes in the hope that God gives. So help and hope become the foundation for the blessed life. Now third, this book brings together the diversity of God and the humanity of man. And it's a perfect resource for our daily devotional readings. And this is because the language of the human heart is on every page, just about. And so it's my prayer that when we open the pages of the Psalms, we can hear the language of our hearts, but we can also hear the language of the heart and the voice of God connecting with our hearts. So that the desire of the Psalms is to hear the will of God and connect it 
to our own life that is seeking and trying to live out the will of God. I really, really like that, uh, that concept. Um, before we dive into looking at this whole notion of the blessed life, uh, let me share with you some other guidelines I think are real crucial. The first is to begin to appreciate the metaphors and the similes and the, uh, the Hebrew poetry that is used all through the book of Psalms. Uh, and the reason this is significant is because you don't want to read the Psalms like you would a commandment of Jesus. Psalms are not necessarily commands, uh, especially when you start looking at uh, pictures uh, and then you ask the question, well, uh, how, how am I supposed to take some of these images? Remember in Psalm 22, when we talked about Jesus appropriating that psalm as he dying on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And in that psalm, as the psalmist is describing his plight, he has all kinds of images that obviously cannot be literal. He's using them to help you as a reader to kind of feel the kind of trouble he's in. For example, I thought about saying this again. Remember when we looked at Psalm 22, he has that imagery of being surrounded by the bulls of Bashan. Now, I've only been in a barnyard once with a bull running after me. And I was able to jump over the fence and I was okay. I cannot imagine <laughs> the feeling of being in a field surrounded by bulls and it looks like there's no way out. Now, now you just imagine being in that setting and, and, and how that would grab your emotion of survival. You know, well, that's the kind of thing that these metaphors are designed to do. Kind of reach in your heart and grab on it so you can feel what he was feeling. And uh, so metaphors, you have to realize why they're being used. Uh, they're not used for information. They're used for emotion. Uh, they're used for feeling of what life is like. And that's why it's so crucial to understand uh, the similes, a lot of similes in there too. Uh, and then the poetry, and I think we talked about this a little bit before, and we don't have time to go over it again tonight, but many of your Old Testament scholars who study the poetry of the Old Testament recognize about three different kinds of Hebrew poetry going on in the Psalms themselves, all the way from parallelism uh, to progressive thought, and then there's other kinds of poetry. Uh, but you begin to realize it's a lot different from English poetry, but when you, when you hear it read, it has sort of a poetic cadence to it, and, and it is, it's rich Hebrew poetry, and it's written that way. Uh, any of, let's see, how can I, here's, here's how I want to slip into a doorway here of a discussion, and I, any of you here write poetry? Anybody here tonight? Any of you write poetry? <clears throat> I enjoy writing poetry. Um, and the reason I'm bringing this up is because I remember a couple of times I would write some poetry and I would give it to Nancy to read and she'd go, oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Which meant how I put my poem together somehow didn't connect with her understanding of what I thought I was communicating. And, and I've read other poetry where I have found myself uh, trying to think of it in terms of information. And, and, and if you try to use the, the, the information lens to interpret poetry, uh, you're going to get somewhat into trouble. Here, here's, here's another illustration I often use. Um, and I wish I could remember what movie it was. My daughter was in uh, the 12th grade, and she wanted me to go see a movie with her. And I went to see the movie. And what I remember was a lot of action in the movie and coming out with the worst headache in the world. And I was, I was rubbing my forehead, and, just, and she goes, Dad, are you okay? I said, I couldn't make sense of the movie. And she, and she said, what do you mean? I said, well... I was trying to figure out where everything fit in. And then here was her response. I'll never forget. She goes, Dad, you don't watch movies like that, especially this one. You're just supposed to immerse yourself in the movie. 
I'm like, immerse yourself in the movie. What is that about? You know? So it, and it's as if, and, and of course you know what I'm talking about because there are movies out there now, the way they're constructed by the director, it's such that all the action draws you in and you get lost in that world. And a good movie will do that. And you're not sitting there trying to figure it out. You're actually feeling like you're in the movie. And uh, so poetry uh, in the book of Psalms is, is written a lot like that. It's designed to draw you into the life experience of the psalmist. And too often we try to sit there and figure everything out and we miss the very point that he's trying to make. And this is what's called immersion in the emotive language. That's the fancy phrase for it. But we get immersed in that world uh, of the psalmist. With all of that going on, something else neat happens. Uh, all of that serves as a bridge between our beliefs and our experience. Uh, there's some wonderful things said about God in the book of Psalms you won't find anywhere else. There's some really neat things said about the covenant that you won't find anywhere else in the Bible. Some really neat things said about the law that's not said anywhere else in the Bible. Uh, the book of Psalms uh, brings together foundational beliefs, but with life experience and with the heart. And it's just amazing how that happens. Uh, I... I think I told this as we started the whole series on Psalms off. When I was a teenager, I remember uh, the preacher at the church where I grew up, uh, he preached a sermon one Sunday out of the text there in Psalms where it says, uh, deep calls unto deep, and only the shallows respond, was his response to that phrase, deep calls unto deep. And he did what the psalmist did. That is trying to talk about the inner struggles of life. And for some reason, I guess at that point in my life as a teenager, that phrase, deep calls into deep, really, I mean, it hit a nerve. And that's when I first began to realize how important the Psalms were. It made me read them more. Of course, when I'm a teenager, there's obviously a, a lot that, that I didn't understand. But diving into the Psalms, that was my first uh, motivation to do that uh, because of that particular lesson. Okay, well, um, let us begin by looking at this whole context of the idea of the blessed life. Uh, when we look at Psalm 1 and verse 1, the Psalms open up with Blessed is the man who doesn't walk in the counsel of the godly or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers. But blessed is the man who doesn't walk. And in, uh, in the Psalms and in the wisdom literature, there's different variations of what's called the two ways. There's usually a choice. Notice here that the one who is blessed doesn't do some things, but he doesn't leave it there. Notice in verse 2, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. He doesn't delight in these things, but he does delight in this. And the person, as the whole book of Psalms starts off, who delights in the law of the Lord is the one who is blessed. And that's how the book of Psalms starts off. Notice it's in chapter 2 and verse 12, which is the last verse of verse 12, or last verse of chapter 2. Remember we talked about this last week as we looked at the whole psalm, Psalm 2. Kiss the son lest he be angry and you're destroyed in your way, for his wrath will flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Another issue with this that's really cool is 1-1 and 2-12 sort of serve as a, a two-chapter introduction, it seems, to the rest of the book of Psalms. And this frames that whole introduction. And because of that, notice, blessed are those who take refuge in Him. 
the idea of God being refuge is one that's really going to be picked up in the book of Psalms quite strongly. Uh, a lot of times, uh, especially if it's David writing, uh, he's got his enemies who are after him. And he recognizes pretty quickly that the only way he can be saved from them is God being his refuge that he can count on. Uh, I've often thought about it. It's interesting uh, to think about how we use and think of the word refuge today. Now, we hear of refugees. That's a whole different topic and idea related to it. But refuge. Well, refuge is finding a place of safety. Uh, Nancy and I, a couple, this was a couple weeks ago, we were watching on the Weather Channel a story of some families who sought refuge in different places when a tornado went through town. And kind of at the end of that program, uh, they were trying to tell you, okay, here are places you need to go for refuge, and if one hits, here are places you don't need to go. I mean, kind of that sort of a teaching moment there at the end of those stories. But refuge, how, how, how do we conceive of, how do we think of refuge? Uh, and if God truly is our refuge today, what does that mean? Can we think of God as our refuge? Are there times when we need to think of God as our refuge? And it's interesting, all these different metaphors in the book of Psalms, because remember we started going down that path one Wednesday night. There's a ton of them about who God is. And, and your notion and idea of, of who God is, a basic a foundational faith tenet, belief that you have, uh, your notion of who God is can be widely broadened just by the Psalms. And uh, that, if nothing else, that would be one of the reasons for you uh, that you need to, to read it. But blessed are all who take refuge in him, uh, and that's the blessed life. Well, let's look at the idea of the blessed life. Uh, it is rooted in the Old Testament concept of blessings, blessings and curses. Uh, if you are faithful to God, blessings will be poured out on you. If not, curses will be. And in the Old Testament, they're also presented as consequences. Uh, God is not an arbitrary, capricious God who just one day happens to have a bad day, so he rains down curses on his people. That's not the way God's ever presented. Uh, interestingly, some of the Greek and Roman gods look like they function that way. If they have a bad day, watch out. But for the God of the Old Testament, the way the Hebrews, the way David sings about God, God is one who is looking for covenant faithfulness. And tied to that, are blessings. And if you violate the covenant and I'm trying to think what are the word to use, uh, disregard but violate um, in, in, in the remember the first of the Ten Commandments, if that happens, God says you make me a jealous God. I am a jealous God. I don't want you to have anything else before me. So in the Psalms there are all kinds of ways in which faithfulness and blessings are tied together and described for the people of God. This idea of a blessed life is also blessings coming from God are closely tied with ethical choices to honor Him. When I live intentionally in a righteous way, and it doesn't mean I'm perfect or don't make mistakes, but if I, if I live the kind of life that is right, making the kind of ethical choices to honor God, then God will bless us. And think about how crucial that is. That I am on many occasions presented with opportunities of making two different choices. And sometimes it's one that's a very, very bad choice if I go one direction, but it's a very, very good one if I go another direction. And I need to know which one honors God and which one doesn't. And that's part of being faithful to God. And the idea of a blessed life is making those kind of choices that honor God that have blessings attached to them. 
um, in the Old Testament, in the Greek, it's in the plural as it is in the Hebrew. It's the same thing in the Beatitudes. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The word blessed is in plural form. And translators don't know what to do with that. In fact, when you just, you just read the word blessed, you don't even think about whether it's singular or plural. It's just kind of a state of being. But there must be something to the fact that the word both in Hebrew and in Greek is in plural form. It's fascinating to think about that. It's not just, okay, if I honor God with my life, then I'll probably have something good happen. It's not just one blessing. It, it's almost as if, and this is where I'm trying to wrap my, wrap my mind around this, it's almost as if I think that the word's plural because it, it, it's a way of wrapping your arms around your entire life. Even, and in the Psalms, this comes out real strongly. Even if there are tough times, you're still living the blessed life because it includes everything. Yeah. A royal term in both, both languages as the king or the queen would say, we, instead of saying I. Oh, yeah. This is a blessing that comes from God. This is a royal blessing. This is something that comes from God himself. Yeah, a royal blessing. I like that word. I don't know why they ever put those two together. Royal blessing. Because it comes from God who is king, God who is creator, and it's a multiplicity of blessings, not just one. Cool. I'll, I need to pursue that. I like that. <laughs> Thanks for bringing that up. Okay. Um, now, Psalm 18 and verse 6, as we continue the idea of the blessed life, the Lord lives, and blessed be my rock, and exalted be the God of my salvation. What's interesting is, this is a turnabout, where that the blessed life blesses the one who blesses it. Think about this. The Lord lives. Now, one thing that's, let's see, I'm trying to figure out how to say this. In the Psalms, you're not going to find any extended argument for the existence of God. It's just not there. I want, I've often wondered if a normal Hebrew would have, would have even thought to raise the question of whether or not there was God. There's, there's the assumption all through the Psalms that the Lord lives. And if that is true, then that changes everything. The Lord lives. And blessed be my... Now notice again, see, instead of just the word refuge, there's a metaphor here. Blessed be my rock. Now think about what all is intended for God. To, have, have you ever heard people say, well, I was so glad that so-and-so was with me when that uh, terrible event happened in my life because they were my rock. You know, and maybe we've all said that about different people, and that's okay. But guess who the ultimate rock is? For the psalmist, the Lord lives, and I bless him because he is my rock. And if you look through the Psalms and you see... Um, how unstable and how chaotic his life was, both from some things that looked like it was just natural consequences to the fact that he's got all these enemies after him. He's even got friends, he says, who betray him. I mean, there are days that look like they're pretty dark days. But in the midst of all of that, God is his rock. It, it, it almost reminds me of the affirmation in Hebrews 13.8 such a beautiful verse that all of us who are Christians need to read that every now and then. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Man, what a great verse. Because everywhere I look, it looks like change occurs. I don't see much that's not changing. <laughs> it's almost as if change is norm. What doesn't change is Jesus. He is the foundation of our whole Christian life, our whole belief, the way that we live. He's the foundation of our hope and our destiny. I can just keep on going and on. But 
he doesn't change. And the psalmist says that about God. So he knows the Lord lives. He knows his life is blessed because of that. So he turns around and blesses the rock that blesses him. And exalted be the God of my salvation. Two things here. In the Psalms, there's a lot of wonderful exaltation language. All the way from Alleluia to exult. And then there are other things that kind of go along with that too. But exaltation language. And there are some Christian writers today that think that in the, the last you know, 2,000 years of the church, one of the things that has slowly eroded away is our ability as a, um, as a group of Christians when we assemble, if we're not careful, we lose the ability to engage in exaltation of the majesty of God. And that's not just saying that we, you know, people sing praise hymns, they think they've done it. Well, there's exaltation spoken in all kinds of ways. And if we're thinking about giving God honor, praise, and glory when we assemble, uh, exaltation language will do it. And the Psalms provides a lot of that language that we may need to recapture in some of our assembly language. But notice also, exalted be the God of my salvation. Uh, here's the interesting thing. Uh, we've mentioned a little bit that there are concepts in the Psalms that when you take them to the New Testament, they kind of, um, how do I want to say this? They get expanded, and for obvious reasons. David's view of salvation is much different than what we talk about today as salvation. Okay? What do you think probably the, the biggest idea is that he attaches to the word salvation. Thinking about David, knowing about his life, uh, knowing the Psalms the way you do, what do you think is the idea that he attaches to salvation? Deliverance. Exactly. Now, at the core of salvation is the idea of deliverance because when we come to the New Testament with that idea, ah, so we're delivered from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Paul says that. We're delivered from the bondage of the fear of death. And if you go in the, just through the New Testament, look at the things we're delivered from. It's a key concept of salvation. Not the only one, but David's concept of salvation being delivered is much more restricted than how we as Christians view it, although his... Um, sort of practical experience of deliverance sets the stage for our understanding of spiritual deliverance, which is kind of cool. Uh, and many of our New Testament um, concepts of, related to faith have rich Old Testament backgrounds to them. And this one of salvation certainly is one. Um, Look at the next verse, Psalm 21, 6. For you make him most blessed forever, and you make him glad with the joy of your presence. Uh, the idea of being most blessed. And let's see, I, I, there was something that I wanted to point out in chapter 21, and what, that's in verse 6. If you have Psalm, jump over there. And in this particular verse, O Lord, the king rejoices in your strength. See, this is one of those royal psalms. Surely you have granted him eternal blessings and made him glad with the joy of your presence. That's the way the NIV translates it. So that the psalmist recognizes that the king himself in his royal position is blessed by God. And here's what is so fascinating about the role of the king in Israel's history. When the king was faithful before God and faithful in his leadership, Israel enjoyed 
tremendous blessings because of that. But look at what happens when the kings start to decide to go their own direction and disregard the will of God. Not only do they suffer individually, but Israel as a nation suffers, especially if they go off in the direction that the king wants to go off into. Psalm 28, 6. Blessed be the Lord, for he has heard the voice of my pleas for mercy. It is this verse that a Christian writer named Henry Nowen wrote a little booklet called uh, A Cry for Mercy. And this is the verse that he based his book on. And, and in that book, it's, it's his uh, poetic prayers that he wrote at significant times in his life when the only thing he could do was cry out to God for mercy. Now, we all have had those times. And the psalmist here in 28.6 is he is blessing God because he knows. Remember earlier, he knows the Lord lives. Well, because the Lord lives, he's heard the voice of my pleas for mercy. And he is confident that God is listening to his cries and pleas for mercy. Now, again, take that concept and let's bring it over to the Christian life. Think about the confidence about that whole concept that we bring into our prayer life. We believe God lives and we bless God. We're thankful to God. We're grateful to him because we know he's heard the voice of our pleas for mercy. And boy, when we have those moments and those times of pleading, pleading uh, it makes a world of difference to know that you've got a God who hears that. Now, it doesn't mean he's always going to answer it the way you're crying out, but God hears those cries of mercy. He heard them, in, think about this, he heard Jesus cry on the cross. Now, God could have, but he didn't. God could have reached down and taken Jesus off the cross. He heard his cries for mercy, but he allowed it to keep on. So did Jesus. So just because God hears the cry for mercy doesn't mean he's going to step in and alleviate the pain. Yeah, Tom? Oh, I thought you, okay. <laughs> I thought you raised your hand. <laughs> uh, Psalm 31, 21. Blessed be the Lord, for he has wondrously shown his steadfast love to me when I was in a besieged city. Oh, boy, I wish he, <laughs> wish he had given us more about the setting of that event because uh, it sounds like he was, he was in a city where he was outnumbered and he didn't know how to get out of it. Uh, but he said, Blessed be the Lord, for he has wondrously shown his steadfast love to me when I was in that kind of situation. Uh, and he doesn't say what God did or didn't do, but he just says that God showed, has wondrously shown his steadfast love. Now here, here's what's interesting. When the person who's living the blessed life can turn around and recognize that God has wondrously shown his steadfast love, that's when you can then say back to God, God, may you be blessed. And it raises the question then, in my life and in your life, can you identify where you believe God has wondrously shown his steadfast love to you? See, that's the question. And if you honestly believe God has done that for you, then it, it's no problem. It's easy to do, to turn around and bless the very one who has blessed you. And as in all of our situations, uh, think of how the diversity of answers would be uh, for that particular uh, way of looking at it. Psalm 32.1. Boy, this is, and, and I would suspect on a verse related to forgiveness, this is one that has come up a lot and you probably know this one, Psalm 32, 1. <clears throat> Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Now, it, now when we read that, boy, I mean, through, through Christian lens, we, we know about all of that. Um, not quite sure the limited view that the Jews had of it, but they still believed that the one who lived the blessed life was one whose transgressions were forgiven, perhaps between one another, 
certainly between the person and God, but their sin was covered. Uh, James says that to us, doesn't he? Uh, what is it for the Christian that covers sin? What's the simple answer to that? It's the blood of Christ, isn't it? The blood of Christ covers sin. And the implication is with that imagery, since it covers it over, you can't see it anymore. It's gone. So blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven. Uh, do you know of anyone who is trying to live out the Christian life, but they're miserable because in their mind, they have committed some transgressions or some sin. They're not quite sure God has forgiven them. And they're not quite sure they've forgiven themselves. And so they're not in a blessed state. They're in an anxious state precisely because they don't have this concept that their transgression is forgiven. When it's forgiven, you don't have to deal with it anymore. Along with that is the guilt and shame that went along with that particular transgression or sin. All of that is taken care of. And to me, that is one of the many wonderful blessings of the good news of Jesus Christ. Forgiven sin is precisely that. It's forgiven. It's covered. You don't have to deal with it anymore. And so the one who is living the blessed life lives in such a way that they don't have to have on their shoulders and on their heart this burden of unforgiven sin. And, and I think if you all here tonight in your life, you're at that point, you know the beauty of that. You don't have to walk around with just the burden of unforgiven sin weighing you down. And then the last one, Psalm 32.2 this goes along with it, and this is the next verse why I put it up here. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. <clears throat> this may be one of those passages that's sort of progressive parallelism, but blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity. Now, typically the word iniquity, uh, depending on the word, uh, it can mean all the way from evil intent to lawlessness. Um, and and it, it typically pictures someone who is in their heart rebellious against the very will of God. But blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Uh, that, for, the, for God, uh, that is very important have a spirit and a heart that is not filled with deceit. <clears throat> when you live right before God, one of the first things that God wants you to be accountable for is the condition of your heart. So do I have, dece do I have an, a deceitful intent? Am I up to no good? Am I trying to deceive God and to try to deceive myself and deceive others? Uh, that kind of spirit uh, destroys people destroys relationships, and it destroys one's relationship with God. But blessed is the man, think about this, whose entire life, whose spirit, there isn't any deceit. And that's a, that's a lot of, that's a big difference between recognizing we're human and we're going to make mistakes. That's much different from a life that has intentional deceit in it. And if you've ever known of someone or interacted with someone where it's pretty clear they're intentionally deceitful, and you've ever been on the receiving end of that, that's not a pretty picture. And, and we don't like dealing with people who are deceitful, do we? <clears throat> well, the blessed man is the one that in his spirit, in his heart, he didn't have any deceit. He's honest, trustworthy, and, and, and certainly think of the difference in the kind of life that's being lived out with blessings and consequences uh, depending on where you are on that on that spectrum. Well, let's uh, let's end with prayer tonight, and you be free to go. Dear Heavenly Father, as we come to you tonight, we are so thankful that you've given us this collection of psalms. That through the metaphors and the similes and the poetry, and all the different ways of communication in in all of these psalms, that we can come to a place where we know you better as our sovereign king and we can know our hearts better uh, 
that the blessed life looks to you for strength, looks to you for refuge, looks to you for purpose and meaning uh, and forgiveness and all of the blessings that only you can give. We thank you, Father, for giving us your word. Thank you for this opportunity to reflect on how we can continue to let the Psalms be part of our daily walk. It's in the name of Christ that we pray. Amen. Thank you all for being here tonight.